Hi, I'm Scott, and in this video I'm going to be talking about hard drives and how to choose one. Um, I'm no expert on hard drives insofar as I'm like not a professor of hard driveology. I don't have a PhD in electrical engineering, but I've been messing around with storage and hard drives in particular since about 1992. I've installed probably thousands of hard drives in my day, starting with uh, behemoths like this and working my way up to, well, good old SSDs, which are not actually hard drives, but we're going to talk about them too, because obviously they're a huge thing in the market today, or whatever. As with any computer project, choosing a hard drive starts with defining your goals. In other words, what are you trying to store, how often and how fast you need to access it. So you might be storing tons of small or smallish files like MP3s, for example, or video for just playback, like an HTPC or video for recording, like on a multi-channel DVR for security. Um, you might be doing video editing, or just need to store a bunch of files in a backup sort of setting, or for archival purposes. No one brand of hard drive is perfect. Every manufacturer has good and bad drives, some better than others, and even when you have a good manufacturer that's generally making good drives, you can still get a bad lot of hard drives, which means one manufacturing run happened to be kind of shitty. But generally, when I'm buying a hard drive, I just look for user reviews on sites like Newegg or Amazon, and I really would stay away from any hard drives with less than like a 4.5 star rating, and make sure it has a good like 100 or a couple of hundred reviews. Is one of the problems with newer hard drives when they first come out is people haven't really tested their longevity by definition. I mean, if a hard drive was just released by a manufacturer three weeks ago, you're not going to know whether that hard drive is going to last any longer than three weeks in general, or whether people are going to have reliability problems. Um, that's one of the disadvantages of being on the cutting edge. That and price, which we'll talk more about later. But, like I said, there's no real magic to it. So like I said, in this video I'm going to be talking about both hard drives and SSDs, but let's talk about hard drives first, because I'm sure a lot of you are buying them. Even though SSDs do offer a generally much faster speed and better experience overall, they're a lot more expensive on a per gigabyte or per terabyte basis. And of course, mechanical hard drives offer larger sizes. So first, I want to talk about the inside of a hard drive. Now, this is a hard drive. It's a little bit old, just like any other you might have seen. And one thing about hard drives is they haven't changed much over the years in general form factor or functionality. In fact, this old unit right here is an MFM hard drive. I think it's 80 megabytes, and it's from 1987. And if you look at this guy and this guy, other than the size, they're very similar to each other. They both have platters in the center that spin, and this is where all the data is stored. They both have armatures with heads on them, and this is what actually reads the data. So this platter right here spins, and this head moves back and forth. And so on a hard drive, data is stored all over this platter, and when you need to access a certain piece of data, the platter needs to rotate, the platter is always rotating by the way, but the platter needs to rotate into position and the head needs to go to hover over where the data is going to be when the platter hits that position. And when that data aligns with that head, it can read it and then your computer gets the information off your hard drive. And at its essence, that's how they work. That's how this one from 1987 worked and that's how this much smaller 2.5 inch hard drive from about, I think, 2012 works. And that's how most any hard drive you'll buy now works. It's one thing for me to talk about the operation of a hard drive, but let's actually see one in action. This video shows a hard drive that's writing files. I'm writing 220 files, each one 500 megabytes in size, and they're being written one by one. And this hard drive was completely blank when I started. So what you're going to see is the head traversing across the surface of the platters and it's going from the outside towards the inside. And you might see it jitter around a little bit. Um, part of it is it's writing file and file allocation information, or in this case it's Linux, so it's writing inodes. But basically that's data written to the hard drive telling the operating system where to find pieces of each individual file. But generally you can see that it's writing from the outside of the hard drive towards the inside. And not all hard drives will necessarily fill up the same way. In fact, if your hard drive is not empty, your data could end up being stored all over the place. 
The script that I had writing those files was naming them file 1 through file 220. And the real point of that video is just to show you that as it was writing them, file 1 was going to be on the outside of the drive, or outside of the platters, and file 220 was towards the center. Which brings me to this video, which shows now reading those files, but I'm going to read them in a few different ways. First, I start by mounting the disk, and you can see that it's reading the file descriptors and going through the file system information. Now I'm going to go to the disk, and you'll see if I list the contents of the drive. Now, this is taking a while because this drive was not in good shape to begin with. That's why I took it apart, was because it was starting to fail. But I'm not really trying to show you how a, how a drive works when it's working perfectly. In fact, the problems with this drive can be a little instructive. So first, I'm going to start by just reading file number one. And if you're not familiar with Linux, this is outputting the contents of that file to dev null, which basically just means throw out the output from, uh, from the file. And you can see the head sitting right there, and that is where file one is stored, around the edge of the platter. And you can see I got a transfer rate of 14.1 megabytes per second. I mean, opening a hard drive does not do it any good. Here it's reading file 220, which, as I said, is towards the inside of the platters. And you can see it got a little bit of a better read speed at 30.5 megabytes per second. Now, I just read that same file again, and you'll notice that the hard drive didn't do anything physically. That's because it was reading from cache, and you could tell that because it read it at 402 megabytes per second, which is way faster than even the specified maximum speed of this drive. Now, this next command, I'm going to read two files at the same time, file 2 and 219. The reason I'm not reusing file 1 and 220 is because I don't want it to use cache. And you can see here the hard drive is bouncing back and forth between files 2 and 219, file 2 being towards the outside of the platter and file 219 on the inside. And even though file 220 got a read speed of about 30-something megabytes per second, these each got 12 megabytes per second. The idea that I wanted to show there is that when you're reading two files that are far apart, the head needs to move back and forth between those two files, or between the locations of those two files. And so here I'm reading from file 200 and 210, which are physically located a lot closer to each other, and the head's moving back and forth quite a bit less. Now the head only moves back and forth at a particular speed. I mean, it's not going to move back and forth at the speed of light, so it's not going to be instantaneous to go from one file to the other which is why hard drives generally perform very badly for random reads and random writes where data might be scattered all over the platter. As every time that head has to move back and forth, it's getting a bit slower. And here I'm showing you an even worse case scenario where I'm reading three files at once, file 3, 110, and 217, which are towards the outside, middle, and inside of the platter respectively, and you can see the head's going back and forth like crazy. And the read speeds on those are even slower than the previous read speeds. Even when you add them all up, they don't approach the maximum of this hard drive, even in its slightly broken state. Now, here I'm reading those same three files again, but this time it's going to get some of that data from cache, and you can see it performed a lot better, because I just read those files. Now, I just want to really quickly show you um, a little smart information dump on this hard drive. You can see it's got tons of errors. This is a good lesson, by the way, on why not to open a hard drive. When you open up a hard drive, and this one wasn't too great to begin with, it got even worse when I opened it up. Because dust and all sorts of little things can get onto these platters. These platters are very sensitive to, well, pretty much everything. I mean, physical damage, if you touch the platter, it's, it might render the data where you, wherever you touch it unreadable just because of the oils in your fingers. If this hard drive is operating, or if the head is right over the platter, and you were to drop it, that's why you don't drop a hard drive, because if this head hits the platter, it could gouge the platter, or otherwise damage it, and cause your data to become unreadable, at least in that one spot. But if the platter is spinning at the time, it's actually going to gouge a circle around the whole platter, and could ruin a lot of your data. Which, by the way, is another case where SSDs fare a lot better because they're virtually immune to any kind of shock. My point is, on old school hard drives like this, you had to manually park the heads, which meant move the heads off of the platter when you're done with the hard drive, usually right before you shut down the system. 
obviously that's kind of a pain in the ass and easy to forget to do. So modern hard drives will park themselves or in the case of, and this is a laptop hard drive by the way, this is its parked position. The heads kind of rest on this plastic piece right here as opposed to resting over the platters. On this desktop hard drive, the head does not actually leave the platter at any point. Instead, it parks towards the center of the platter where there's no data stored anyway. So this way, if it does collide with the platter, it doesn't damage any data. But over time, if that gets shocked a lot, that can actually damage the head, which is why this one parks and locks the head out of, uh, out of the way. So ultimately, what's the point of all that? Why are we concerned about where on a hard drive data is stored and how these heads move back and forth? Well, one specification of a hard drive that you'll see very often is the number of RPMs. Usually it's 5,400 RPMs, 5,900, 7,200, 10,000, or 15,000 RPM, although 15,000 RPM is generally only found in enterprise-grade high-speed high hard drives. That RPM is the rotations per minute of the platter. The data is stored in various places on the platter, and so in order to access that data, the head has to move over the position where the data is going to be as the platters rotate into that position. So consider that, let's say, in a particular microsecond, your computer wants a piece of data that's right here. Now, the platter has to then rotate almost a full rotation before it could ever hope to get that data to the head. So the faster the platters rotate, the more quickly that data would get into position. So generally speaking, the faster the rotation of the platters, the faster the hard drive is at accessing data. That's not universally going to be the case because as with everything hard drive and SSD related, it depends on workload. So for example, a database server would have a lot of random reads and writes because people could be requesting information from the database that could be stored literally anywhere. It could be somewhat random as far as the hard drive is concerned. And so in that case, the head might be flying back and forth trying to pick up data all over the place and simultaneously trying to write data all over the place. On the other hand, if you have a simple video streaming server and you're only watching one video, you know, it's for your home use, it's for your HTPC in the living room, all the data might be stored in nice linear fashion, just like in my example in the video, where the head will barely have to move and all the data will run right under it. And in that case, a higher RPM hard drive will provide an advantage, but not as much of an advantage as when it comes to a random read and write workload, where the head has to go back and forth almost constantly and pick up data from all over the platter. Incidentally, that's where defragmenting a hard drive comes into play. If you ever heard about defragmenting a hard drive speeding up your system, that is absolutely true. It can speed up your system a lot if you're trying to read and write from a lot of fragmented files. Because fragmentation means that, let's say you have that example of one video file you're trying to watch from start to finish, but your hard drive has a lot of other small files that have been added and deleted to it over the months or years, that one video file might not be stored in a nice linear fashion. It might actually be stored all over the drive. And so in that case, it's more like a random read or write workload. Of course, if you're just reading from one, if you're just trying to read one video, even a 5400 RPM hard drive that's fragmented will be able to handle that. But where the defragmentation really helps is when you're trying to watch that one video file, but your computer is also doing all sorts of other stuff in the background. SSDs don't suffer from fragmentation as much. In fact, SSDs, and we'll talk about this later, in essence sort of fragment your files on purpose to make accessing them faster. In a lot of ways, SSDs sort of have an inverse relationship with hard drives in the way they manage data and the way certain aspects are beneficial to one and not the other. So that's how a hard drive works. What about solid state drives? Well, as I said before, Unlike hard drives, they have no moving parts inside. In fact, I'd love to open one up and show it to you, but I don't have any that are non-functional, and this has the tiniest screws in the world, so I can't even get it open. But here's what it looks like on the inside, at least a typical SSD. A lot less interesting than a hard drive. An SSD offers a lot of advantages over a traditional old-school style hard drive, and that's primarily speed. In fact, 
I always recommend SSDs as an upgrade for an older computer. An SSD and some more RAM can breathe a lot more life into even a fairly old like Core 2 Duo machine. Another tremendous advantage of SSDs over hard drives is power consumption. SSDs use almost no power when they're at idle. It's a tiny trickle, but it's really nothing to worry about, especially compared to what the processor on your device is using, or the screen especially. That's because when SSDs are at idle, they're really not doing anything. Hard drives, even when they're at idle, in other words, when you're not reading or writing data, the platters are still spinning. There are some hard drives like Western Digital Green Drives, that will actually speed up or slow down the platters depending on how much data you need to read or write. But the platter is always spinning. You can set your computer's power management to spin down your hard drive after a certain period of inactivity, but that can mean that there's a little bit of a delay as your hard drive spools back up when you do need to read or write data. So I generally stay away from that. So SSDs are great for portable battery operated devices. They can also, power consumption wise, be a benefit when talking about a large array of disks. Uh, besides the obvious speed benefits, the power consumption is a lot lower. They're of course, as I said before, a lot more expensive than hard drives on a per gigabyte or per terabyte basis. I have a feeling though eventually that will come down and they'll, they'll reach parity and we'll see solid state storage technologies that are outstripping hard drives, both in price and definitely in performance. One interesting thing about SSDs is that they sort of have an inverse relationship to hard drives when it comes to size. In other words, with hard drives, generally the smaller the hard drive, the faster it is. Now also with hard drives, the smaller it is, generally the less storage space it will have, which is kind of true of SSDs in a way. But the reason that a smaller hard drive is generally faster than a larger one is because even in the worst case where data is stored towards, let's say, the center of the platter and other data you need is stored towards the outside, the head only has to move so far. Here it's maybe two centimeters. Whereas here, in that same situation, the head would have to move more like three or three and a half centimeters. And because of the heads of the hard drives, the armature speeds are, co are constrained by the laws of physics and the reality of what we can do with engineering, on both hard drives, the armature should move at about the same speed. So the smaller the distance, the faster it will be. So how is that inverse to SSDs? Aren't all SSDs usually in this form factor, a 2.5 inch form factor, or maybe even an even smaller MSATA add-in card for a laptop? Well, I'm not talking about the size of the case so much as the size of what's inside of it. So let's look at that right here. I got a picture of a typical SSD. This is what it looks like on the inside. It's just a circuit board with a bunch of chips on it. And it doesn't even have a lot of a uh, wide variety of chips on it. The eight chips you see in this particular picture and different SSDs will have different number of chips, which is kind of my point, are the flash storage chips. It's a similar technology to what you might find in SD card or a USB thumb drive. Each of these chips can store a certain amount of data. For example, let's say this is a 64 gig uh, SSD and it has eight flash chips. Well, you could probably guess that each of those flash chips will store eight gigabytes of data. Eight times eight is 64. Now, as technology improves with flash storage and uh, storage densities increase, you would need fewer and fewer chips to achieve the same storage size which is to say, in other words, each individual chip would be able to store more data. But okay, how does that make a bigger one faster? Well, this has eight flash chips, and each chip only has a certain read and write speed that it's capable of. The more chips you have, the more data that can be read or written simultaneously. So for example, let's say each one of those flash chips can read or write 50 megabytes per second. Well, there's eight of them there, so that means it can, this entire SSD should be able to read or write 400 megabytes per second because the controller, which is one of the other chips on this circuit board, actually knows how to allocate data to each of those chips. And for example, with eight chips, it might store a byte of data with one bit on each chip. It might store a byte of data on one chip, another byte on another one, another byte on another one, and writing them all simultaneously. It depends on the manufacturer and how the controller of the SSD works. 
But the point is, the more chips it has, the more parallelism it has, and the more data it can read or write simultaneously per second. Of course, the more chips, the bigger the physical size the circuit board needs to be. So even if it's in an enclosure like this, some SSDs might only have a circuit board that's maybe a third the size of the enclosure. And it might only have two or four flash chips on it. But you might have a larger capacity SSD, like one terabyte, today at least, which has maybe 16 flash chips inside of it on both sides of the board, and the board takes up the full size of the enclosure. There are also add-in cards for usually servers, although you can get them for uh, home PCs as well, which are even physically larger because they have even more flash chips on them. Sometimes that's to increase parallelism so you can read and write more data at once. In other cases, it's to increase total storage capacity because you can't fit at, with current technology, when I'm making this video at least, probably when you're watching it, there'll be a lot more, but you can't fit three terabytes worth of flash storage into this enclosure, at least not with it horribly overheating. When it comes to the speed of SSDs, the controller also factors into that a lot. For example, if the controller is only capable of a maximum throughput of, let's say, 300 megabytes per second, you could have 16 or 24 flash chips on the same card, and if the controller can't pump data through them any faster than 300 megabytes per second, that's what you're going to get. And finally, although it's not really a limitation right now, most SATA buses are only capable of 6 gigabit per second, which is 750 megabytes per second. Most SSDs don't approach that, so you don't really have to worry about your SATA bus being too slow, but eventually that might become a limiting factor. That's one of the reasons why the highest performance SSDs are not in SATA compatible form factors like this, but as I said before, are actually add-in cards that have PCIe bus connectors that are capable of much higher rates of throughput and lower latencies. Another very important specification that you'll look at when you're researching SSDs is IOPS, or input-output operations per second. And that's sort of what it sounds like. That's how many times the computer can request of the controller in the SSD, I want to read a piece of data or I want to write a piece of data. So each time it wants to read or write a piece of data, that's an input or output operation. And obviously per second means how many it can do per second. The benefit to input-output operations per second really doesn't have much to do with when you're reading or writing data in a linear fashion. For example, copying a large video file to or from the SSD. That won't result in a lot of input-output operations because it's able to read data, if you're, let's say, reading the file, in large chunks at a time. When it really comes into play is when you're reading or writing data in smaller chunks. Now, that doesn't mean you're reading or writing smaller files. Just like with a hard drive where you have, if you're reading or writing one file, it might be doing a nice linear read or write. And where you're reading or writing from many files at once, it might be jumping all over the place doing a lot of random activity. Well, it's those random reads and writes where input-output operations come into play. One thing I wanted to talk about, sort of uh, just for general interest here, is that you can see hard drives come in a lot of form factors, and that's specification that you'll see for hard drives all the time. The most common form factors today for hard drives and SSDs are 3.5 inch and 2.5 inch. Now some people find that odd because this hard drive is in no dimension 3.5 inches. In fact, even if you measure the platters, they're not 3.5 inches either. So why do we call this a 3.5 inch hard drive? Well, that comes from the days of floppy disks. This is a floppy disk drive. And you'll notice that a 3.5 inch hard drive is the same size as the floppy drive. So why does that matter? Well, floppy drives came out before 3.5 inch hard drives and computer cases were made with slots to hold 3.5 to hold 3 inch floppy drives. So these smaller hard drives were made to fit into those existing floppy drive slots. Because before 3.5 inch hard drives, there were five and a quarter inch hard drives like this one. These are called five and a quarter inch hard drives simply because the floppy drives that came before them into whose slots these fit in the cases were five and a quarter inch floppies. 
So that 3.5 inch measurement actually comes from the 3.5 inch floppy disk itself, which if you measure it is 3.5 inches across. Another little side note, which you're probably already aware of, but I know a lot of people watching this video might not be old enough to have extensively used floppy disks. They might ask, why do we call this a floppy disk when it's not in fact floppy? I mean, it's bendable, but it's actually a hard plastic case. Well, that's because the disk inside is floppy. Contrast that to five and a quarter inch floppy drives, whose disks were also floppy and in fact made of the same similar material to these, but the actual case of those disks was floppy as well. We call these hard disks because the platters in them are actually hard. You might also be looking at external hard drives or external SSDs if you're shopping for either. There's really not much of a trick to external hard drives or SSDs in that usually they just contain one of these, one of these, or one of these. In other words, when you have an external hard drive, you can usually crack open the enclosure and find a regular old internal style hard drive in that enclosure. And conversely, if you have a regular old internal hard drive like this, you can buy an external enclosure for it and throw it inside. And so there is no real technical difference between an external and internal hard drive or SSD for that matter. It really comes down to how you're connecting them to your computer. If it's an external drive, it's usually connected via USB, Thunderbolt, even Firewire or eSATA. Uh, it could also be connected by Wi-Fi or any number of other technologies. The point is that it has a standard drive inside in most cases. One of the mind boggling things in recent years is that a lot of external hard drives have been cheaper than the equivalent internal hard drives. I don't know why. For a long time, Seagate and Samsung were both putting out external hard drives that were 10, 20, even $30 cheaper than the actual drives that were inside those enclosures. In fact, I bought a bunch of those and pulled them apart because I needed internal hard drives and it was just cheaper to buy the external version. By the way, those enclosures that you get, the external enclosures that are Seagate branded or Western Digital branded, those are sometimes proprietary to the disks inside. In other words, even though the disk inside might be just a generic hard drive, you might not be able to take another arbitrary hard drive and stick it into that enclosure in, in order to reuse it. Some manufacturers also do play tricks on you in that instead of having a standard SATA bus on the hard drive controller, they might put a USB interface on it. As I've said, the common connector on most drives is a SATA connector. Now SATA is not just the specification for this connector itself, it's also a specification for the bus, in other words, the electrical interface between the hard drive and your computer, or more accurately, the hard drive controller on your computer. And SATA interfaces come in a couple of different speeds. Well, three speeds typically, 1.5 gigabits per second, three gigabits per second, and six gigabits per second. 1.5 gigabits per second is an old technology from sort of back in the day. It's not too relevant nowadays. For the most part, even in an older machine that you're still using, you probably have a three gigabit SATA connection, sometimes called SATA 2. Most likely, new computers today will have a SATA 3 connection, which is the six gigabit connection. Now, notice I said gigabit. When I was talking about the SSDs before, I pointed out that six gigabit is about 750 megabytes per second. Most hard drive spe specifications and SSD specifications are given in megabytes per second. Let's say you see an SSD that has a specification of 500 megabytes per second. Well, in megabits, it's actually eight times that. It's 4,000 megabits per second, which is four gigabits. So you can see that that won't max out a SATA 3 six gigabit bus, but it will max out a three gigabit SATA 2 bus which means that an older computer, you will not get the full performance out of that SSD. So when looking at an SSD, the specifications that are really important are input output operations per second and throughput. With hard drives, it's not quite the same. Important specifications include the rotational speed of the platters, 
Generally speaking, in the consumer market, 7200 RPM drives are the fastest and variable speed drives or 5400, 5900 RPM drives are the slowest. The other important spec to look at is seek time. And seek time refers to the amount of time it takes to go from reading one, let's say, byte of data on the drive to another byte. And that's on a hard drive is a combination of the rotational speed and the speed of the armature and sort of the accuracy of the armature as well. The way seek time is calculated is not super standardized across the industry. The most common way of calculating it is by finding the average of all the permutations of going from reading or writing any particular piece of data on the drive to any particular other piece. Which means like the average of how long it would take to read a piece of data here and then seek to a piece of data here. A piece of data here, seeking to a piece of data there. And basically every possible combination of where data could be located, finding an average of that. The lower the seek time, the faster the drive will be, generally speaking. As I said at the beginning of the video, your workload is the most important thing to determining the correct hard drive for you. For example, if all you're going to be doing is using a drive to stream media for your own viewing, for example on HTPC, you don't need a really good seek time. You can go with a pretty slow hard drive because even watching a 4K movie, which might be 40 gigs, you're transferring that 40 gigs over the course of two hours. And so even the worst hard drive that's available today is going to be able to keep up with that. And additionally, assuming your hard drive isn't terribly fragmented, it's not going to need to do much seeking. It's just going to have to read in a nice linear fashion. So seek time isn't even going to come into play. On the flip side of it, let's say you have a multi-channel HD DVR for surveillance purposes and you have like eight cameras hooked up to it. Well, it's going to need to, to write all eight data streams simultaneously. Generally, the busier your hard drive is, or the more fragmented it is, the more of an advantage seek time will give to you. Now, there are certain workloads, like for example databases, that have a lot of random reads and writes where seek time is going to be very important. But generally speaking, if you can afford a hard drive with a high rotational speed and a low seek time, it can't hurt. Faster is always better, especially if you don't know what your workload is going to be exactly. Of course, if you're researching a hard drive, you've come across green drives, blue drives, red drives, purple drives, enterprise drives, Seagate has surveillance drives and archive drives and all sorts of other types of drives, and they all say that they're tuned for a particular workload. For example, enterprise drives, the black drives from Western Digital, are meant to be very fast and long-lasting although they don't necessarily consume small amounts of power and they're not necessarily quiet. Whereas their green drives are meant to be very power conscious, environmentally friendly, but not as fast and generally not as reliable. And I put reliable in quotes because even though they try to make out like their enterprise drives are a lot more reliable than their, for example, green drives or blue desktop drives, a lot of people have shown that there's really not much difference in longevity. However, the warranties do differ a lot. Uh, I think a green drive, for example, only has a two-year warranty, whereas an enterprise drive has a five-year warranty. So even though they might have the same reliability, you're going to get, be able to get your drive replaced in anything longer than two years if it's a higher-end drive. And really, with the higher-end drives, a lot of time, I think that's what you're paying for, is the extra warranty. So let me just review the different types of drives real quick. For example, Western Digital has their Blue Series, which are their desktop drives. Um, Seagate and HDST also have a desktop series of hard drives. They're generally meant for intermittent use, meaning when you're physically at your computer doing stuff, the hard drive is generally active, and if you're not at your computer, you either shut it off or it's pretty idle and it's not doing anything. Um, they're usually pretty quiet and have a reasonable middle-of-the-road performance. Enterprise drives are intended for well, the enterprise, even though they're sold to consumers nowadays, the enterprise thing is kind of just a label. They're, as I just said, faster, generally more power hungry, and they're meant for 24-7 constant use. Contrast that with the real enterprise level SAS drives, and you'll generally see that those enterprise, true enterprise grade SAS drives are a lot faster, have a longer mean time between failure, 
and are more reliable in general. Um, you also see workstation drives, which have kind of fallen out of favor when it comes because SSDs exist. But that's, for example, the Western Digital Velociraptor series, which are 10,000 RPM drives and pretty fast. And then we have NAS drives, for example, the Western, Western Digital Red series, which are intended for 24 by 7 operation, consume less power than the enterprise drives, but generally more than the green drives. They usually have a longer warranty and they have decent performance. Um, there are surveillance drives, which is the Western Digital Purple, just called surveillance drives from Seagate, which are tuned for constant writes. They're intended for DVRs, for surveillance systems. They're meant to be used 24-7. They generally have a larger cache, and although they're not so performance tuned for random access, um, they can, can, can handle a lot of bandwidth from multiple video streams coming in at once. There's also archive grade drives, which are generally slow, relatively reliable, although honestly, they do have reliability problems based on consumer reviews. Uh, at least the new Seagate eight terabyte drives do. But when it comes to any drive, you don't really need to pick the right drive for a particular task. For example, if you were to get, let's say, a really good deal on a Western Digital Purple drive, there's absolutely no reason you can't use that in your desktop computer to store video or all sorts of other stuff. And by the same token, unless you're, unless you're really concerned about power consumption, there's no harm to putting enterprise drives in a NAS or a file server. Same by the same token, you can put green drives in a NAS or file server. It all depends on what your workload's gonna be and how comfortable you are with the shorter or longer warranties, depending. Despite there being so many different types of hard drives, they're all essentially the same. But with SSDs, there is a significant technical difference between the three major types, SLC, MLC, and TLC. SLC is generally the most expensive, but also the most reliable and most performant. MLC sits in the middle, with TLC being the worst of the three. That doesn't mean TLC is terrible. I'll explain why. In the individual flash storage chips, there are cells, and each cell stores data. With SLC, each cell stores one bit, with MLC two and with TLC three. Now, that doesn't sound like it's a bad thing to store three bits on a cell, except for the fact that cells have a limited number of life cycles. See, I said before an SSD gets hot when you write to it, and that's because it's actually changing the physical structure of the chip when it's written to. Chip starts out having all zeros. When you want to write a one, that's a physical change to the chip. When you want to change that one back to a zero, that's another physical change. Changing it to a one is called a program cycle, and changing it to a zero from a one is called an erase cycle. Now, if you need a zero in a particular location on a flash chip and it's already zero, nothing needs to be done. Same if it's already a one. But when you want to write all new data to a flash drive, and let's say it's completely different ones and zeros than what might already exist, then you're changing the state of each bit in each cell. And that's an important specification to look for when researching SSDs, is the number of PE, or program erase cycles. The more cycles, the more reliable the drive is going to be over time because the more data that can be rewritten to each cell of the flash storage. Now, on some drives, you might see PE cycles as low as like 3,000. That doesn't mean if, it, let's say, it's a 100 gig drive, that doesn't mean you could just write 100 gigs to it 3,000 times and the drive's going to die. Because, as I said, if there's already a zero in a particular location, you're writing a zero, no change has to be made. It's only when it's programmed or erased. Now, also, over the life of a drive, even in a desktop computer, you may write thousands of times the, the capacity of the drive, particularly when dealing with a page file or other temporary files. There's tons of stuff being rewritten to your hard drive or SSD on your computer all the time. The controllers in SSDs are very smart, though. They're well engineered. When you write a piece of data to an SSD over and over again, let's say for a page file or a temporary file, that could generate a lot of writes. However, the controller is smart enough to spread those writes over the different flash cells over time. So it's not like if you're constantly re rewriting one file, you're going to be burning out the same few cells. The reason SLC is more reliable and generally lasts longer than a TLC is because an SLC you're writing one bit per cell. 
So if I go in and change one bit, let's say part of one file, I only need to change that one cell once. In a TLC, that other file might cohabitate with other bits from another file in the same flash cell. So I might be programming or erasing that same flash cell multiple times for different files. And by the way, having insufficient RAM in your computer may cause unnecessary wear and tear on your SSD. Now, usually when a computer pages to disk or uses a swap file, as the case may be, you would notice a re severe reduction in performance because on a hard drive, using a hard drive in place of memory is extremely slow, painfully slow. But using a very fast SSD in place of RAM, well, it's still a lot slower than RAM, but it may not make your user experience crawl to an unbearable, unbearable halt. So your computer might be low in memory and you might be paging out or swapping out a lot of memory and you might not even notice it, but that's gonna cause a lot of wear and tear on your SSD. So one tip, always make sure you have plenty of RAM in your computer. That's generally true though. I mean, I'm sure you all know that. Another type of drive you'll see out there is called a hybrid drive. A hybrid drive is a regular hard drive with an SSD built into it. Usually on the same controller board for the rest of the hard drive components will be a few flash chips and a flash controller. So it's basically just having these two drives in one. And there are a couple of different ways they use the SSD. Western Digital, for example, makes a drive that has a built-in SSD, but the SSD actually acts as a completely independent drive. In other words, the SSD might be the C drive or the root device on your computer, whereas the hard drive por uh, portion might be the D drive or you know, your home directory on your computer. Another way SSDs are used in hybrid drives is as a cache. Now, all hard drives have a cache, but it's usually very small on the order of a few megabytes. And that's just to smooth out writes so that it doesn't have to write one byte of data here and one byte of data here. It's so that it can batch them up so it can write a bunch of data to one portion of the drive and a bunch of data to another portion of the drive, thereby making it a little bit more performant. With an SSD cache, it might be multiple gigabytes, 32, 64, 128, whatever it happens to be. And the way it'll work then is that all the data that your computer is pushing to the drive to write will get written to the SSD and then at its leisure written to the hard drive. That means you could get SSD style performance with hard drive style capacity. That becomes a problem when you max out the size of the cache, because when the cache is consumed completely, well then it slows down to regular hard drive speed. So for example, if it let's say had a 32 gigabyte cache, as soon as you try to write 33 gigabytes or 34 gigabytes, then it's gonna write at hard drive speeds. It's actually going to differ a little bit because as you're writing the first 32 gigs, some of it will be dumped to the hard drive. But eventually you're going to hit a wall where that hybrid drive just becomes a regular hard drive as far as performance goes. It will also speed up reads because anything that's cached on the SSD can be read from the SSD at a much higher speed than the hard drive. But that can also lead to very inconsistent performance because if let's say you write a large file to the drive, part of that file might be in cache and part of that file might be on the hard drive. And so accessing parts of that file will give you SSD type speeds, maybe 400 megabytes a second, whereas other parts of the file might only be readable from the hard drive at 100 megabytes per second. So particularly when dealing with video editing or large video files, that can lead to some very inconsistent and unwanted performance. I talked briefly about hard drive warranties before, but I kind of want to give you my two cents on the value of them, because like I said, the difference between a desktop drive and an enterprise drive may only come down to the warranty length. It depends on the hard drive specifications, of course. So is it worth it to spend an extra 30, 40, 50, even you know, $100, depending on the capacity of the drive, for a five-year versus a two-year warranty? If the hard drive is being used intensively, in other words, you're doing a lot of read writes, or if it's exposed to high heat or vibration or some other factor that may cause premature failure, then yes, the longer warranty may be worth it for you in the end. But I've had a lot of hard drives that had two year warranties and they don't fail until after five years. That's not to say I haven't had any hard drives fail. I'm talking generally speaking, a hard drive should last more than five years. And just for the sake of example, if let's say you get 
five desktop grade hard drives for the price of three enterprise grade drives, really what are the chances that two of those desktop hard drives are going to fail before the five years of the enterprise drives warranty? So just something to consider when you're looking at the different prices. In my experience, paying the higher price for the bigger warranty is not huge. However, if you're buying used hard drives on the aftermarket, I would definitely look for enterprise or black drives or any kind of drive with a five-year warranty. Because the drives are already a little bit old. If you get a three-year-old drive that still has two years of warranty, you don't know what the person who owned it before you did with it. They could have abused the hell out of it. So at least you have that extra warranty period for yourself. And warranties are transferable, by the way. If you buy a used hard drive, you can return it to the manufacturer, same as if you bought it yourself. One good source for information on hard drive longevity is Backblaze. They're a backup company that has, I don't know, I think petabytes of storage. And they have just absolute shitloads of hard drives operating 24-7. And they generally buy consumer grade hard drives, the same ones that you're probably looking at. And they usually buy higher capacity drives, but because they've been around for a while, they've in their environment tested in the real world hard drives anywhere from two terabytes, I think up to six terabytes at the time of this video. Although their data isn't exactly comprehensive and that doesn't cover every model of every manufacturer, they do show some general trends with hard drives. One is infant mortality rate. And infant mortality is something that's well known both in hard drives and in other industries. And that's premature early failure of a hard drive, meaning within the first few months or even the first year. That's usually because the hard drive has some kind of manufacturing defect in it that causes its lifespan to be very short. But remember that hard drive prices do drop steeply. So you might be buying a drive today that costs $150, but in three years, that drive is maybe going to be worth, what, $75? So your warranty is really not covering the full original value of the drive, because if you went to replace it, you're really only out 75 bucks, not 150 So that warranty doesn't really cover the full value of the drive by year three. If it fails in year four, you're really getting a replacement hard drive that's worth even less. So take that into account when you're considering the value of a warranty. Now, power cost isn't something that people usually consider when buying a hard drive, but I'm gonna tell you why it's something you might wanna consider. And yeah, if you have one or two hard drives in your house and a couple of computers, it's probably not a concern for you at all because it's really not gonna cost a lot to run the hard drives. It does become a concern though when you start amassing hard drives like I have. When you're talking about 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 hard drives, then you're talking about a significant amount of power consumption. Uh, for example, I was into enterprise hardware for a while, I still am, and I, you can get a lot of good enterprise hardware used on eBay. This MSA70 chassis, for example, holds 24 2.5 inch drives. However, the chassis itself, by the way, takes about 100 watts of power just by itself. And any NAS device or file server you have is going to have a baseline power consumption. But when you add the hard drives to this MSA70, even just consumer grade hard drives, it doubles the power consumption from 100 watts to 200 watts. And for me, that works out to about $30 a month just to run those hard drives. Back in 2013, I became really concerned with the amount of power all my hard drives were drawing, so I, I did a little bit of research into it. And again, these are 2013 numbers, but at the time, a two terabyte Western Digital Green hard drive, which is their eco-friendly, low power consumption drive, costs about $140. The same drive in a 2.5 inch form factor costs $180 or $40 more. The electrical costs for the 3.5 inch hard drive worked out to 70 cents per month and for the 2.5 inch it was 12 cents per month. That's based on my own rates of about 20 cents per kilowatt hour. Now assuming a service life of six years, which is probably about what I run a hard drive for, the 3.5 inch drive will cost $58 to operate with a 2.5 inch drive only costing $10 to operate. Now again, the difference there really just comes from the platter size. These larger platters are a lot heavier than these smaller ones, and so it takes more energy to spin them and to keep them spinning. So the total cost of ownership, meaning the amount that it cost me to actually buy the drive plus the cost of the power to run the drive, was $197 for the 3.5 inch drive, 
but only 189 for the 2.5 inch. Now, not a huge difference. We're talking $12 over the course of six years. That's not the amount of money that I'll miss. Even if I multiply that by 10 for 10 hard drives, okay, $120 over six years, not a big deal. But I tell you this to illustrate the fact that 2.5 inch drives can, over the course of their lifetime, be cheaper than 3.5 inch, even though they cost more to buy up front. Now, if you're cooling your space where you have, let's say, a large file server or NAS, these hard drives are also gonna generate a lot less heat than these hard drives. So your air conditioning bill will also be lower. I didn't factor that in in those numbers, although I did factor that in in my overall study. Now that comparison was between two green drives. The green drives are both uh, supposed to be very eco-friendly, very low power consumption. But what about an enterprise style drive running at 7200 RPM versus let's say a 5900 RPM drive? So if we compare a three terabyte Western Digital RE drive, uh, it would cost about $100 over the course of six years for me to run it. Whereas a three terabyte consumer grade 5900 RPM drive from Seagate would cost $52. That's a difference of nearly $50 over the course of six years. Again, it doesn't sound like a huge amount. It's not even $10 a year, which is not even a dollar a month. But if I have 20 hard drives in my house, well, that's $1,000 over the course of six years. And that's something to be looked at. So if I don't need the performance of the Western Digital Enterprise grade drives, which in a lot of cases I don't. For example, for a file server, for a backup server, you don't necessarily need high performance. So don't go for the high performance drives unnecessarily. If you want to know more about the uh, research I did and the power numbers I got, you can go to s.co.tt and I have the spreadsheet posted on there, that this link. I'm even gonna nag you about backups in this video because even if you buy the best hard drive out there, the most reliable one with the longest warranty, if all your data is just stored on that one hard drive and it fails, well, you're shit out of luck. So backups are absolutely essential for everyone. And people have been harping on backups and the need for backing up since day one of computers. And it's no different today because most people don't back up properly. So let's talk about them real quick. Well, we're real slow. We'll see how long this takes. There are two main types or categories of backup, online and offline. Online backups mean that the backups are accessible all the time, usually because they're stored in hard drives or arrays of hard drives. Offline backups are more like a Blu-ray or a tape or something you store to and then you can put it in a drawer and forget about it. That could also include an external hard drive that you back up your data to and then disconnect and put away. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage of hard drive based backups is ease of use and availability. They're always on, you can always copy data to them to back it up and you can always pull data from them to restore it. They also have a large amount of contiguous storage. The downside of hard drive based backups is they're prone to failure and they may require some maintenance in the, in the case of, for example, a NAS array where you might have one hard drive fail and you need to replace it. And backing up to a hard drive also has the risk of from malware, viruses, or any other type of computer-related problem, or even accidental deletion. Uh, even if you're using an external hard drive, you do eventually have to connect that external hard drive to your computer to do your backups, and during that time, it may become infected with malware, or malware that you already have in your computer could delete files, corrupt files, or encrypt files. The most common way people back up nowadays is probably to cloud storage. And cloud storage has a lot of advantages. I mean, it's always there when you need it. It's run by someone else. You don't have to worry about maintaining it. Uh, it's virtually unlimited storage, although you might be paying per gigabyte, so it might not be free storage. Um, disadvantage, though, the main one that I have, the main problem I have with cloud storage is that someone else is in possession of your data. And unless you're going to very well encrypt it before you upload it to them, all your data is with them, so if someone compromises their system, they can have access to your data. The other major disadvantage with cloud storage is slow backup and restore speeds because it has to go out over the internet, and so you're limited to whatever your internet connection happens to be. And what if you're packing up a large amount of data, but you need to use your upstream bandwidth for something else? Well, then you're fighting with your own backup process. So backing up to the cloud, I'm personally not a huge fan of it because I like running my own infrastructure, 
but believe me, it is be absolutely better than nothing. And cloud storage would almost exclusively be an example of online storage. In other words, your data is always accessible. It's not like you're writing it to a cloud and then the owner of the cloud is taking a tape of your data and putting it in a storage room somewhere. For your mission critical backups, I mean like your really important stuff, uh, family photos, anything that's irreplaceable, documents, uh, videos, stuff like that. I would always recommend writing that to optical media, particularly some kind of high quality, maybe archival grade optical media. Now granted, Blu-rays don't store nearly as much data as a hard drive. They're good for about 50 gigabytes per disk. But hopefully that's enough for you to store most of your essential information. Now, of course, writing a Blu-ray disk can be a pain in the ass because it takes a long time and you actually have to do it manually. But that in conjunction with an online, story, uh, with an online backup solution like cloud storage or an external hard drive is really the way to go. Now, tape is kind of an outdated solution nowadays. Um, you can still buy tape drives. They're mostly targeted for the enterprise, um, and they're generally fairly expensive, and then you've got to worry about the media, and uh, tapes are a lot more susceptible to moisture and other sorts of vagaries of being around a regular house. Now, I would never recommend flash or removable media of any sort, like SD cards or even SSDs because they can degrade over time, and especially cheap flash storage media like uh, USB drives, not well made, not reliable, not something I would trust all my data to. The question becomes, do you store it on-site or off-site? Now, on-site means you have it, for example, in your house or in your office, wherever your computer and all your data is normally. The advantage of that is, of course, that you can do a restore very quickly and very easily, because if your data gets deleted or corrupted or somehow destroyed, you have that backup on hand and you can easily slot it into your computer, connect it to your computer and start copying data back right away. The disadvantage of course is that if let's say your house gets robbed, the thief might steal your external hard drive along with your computer and then your data is completely gone. Or in the event of a fire or flood or some other sort of disaster, well again, if your computer is wiped out, probably so will your external hard drive or your optical media backups. Of course, optical media fares fairly well in water, but in the case of fire, either, in a, either one is screwed. That's why when I make optical backups, I usually take a copy of them to my father's house, which is in Florida. I don't go there that often, but every six months or so, I bring a fresh backup copy of all my critical data and hide it in his house down there. Maybe a little paranoid to store it uh, halfway across the country, but that's what I do. Certainly couldn't hurt. Now the same goes for online backups. If you're managing your own online backups, if it's cloud storage, it's going to be off-site, right? But if you're managing your own backups, and let's say you're backing up to a NAS or file server in your own house, again, you're susceptible to the same problems as any other on-site backup. That's why I, again, also have a backup server located at my office, connected to my house via VPN, and all my data is backed up to that as well. This way it's online, I can easily recover data from it, Although, to be fair, instead of trying to transfer all my data back over the internet, I would actually just go to my office and then bring the server to my house. But having backups off-site is very important, at least for me. And it should be for you, too. So like I said in the beginning of the video, the first thing you need to figure out is what you're using the storage for and how you're going to be using it. What's your workload going to be like? you don't necessarily need to go for the most expensive, fastest hard drive or SSD out there. In fact, you might be better off with a cheaper option in the long run. Go with hard drives when you need large capacity, go with SSDs when you need high performance. That's a general rule. Enterprise, NAS, desktop, probably doesn't matter for most home users. Unless you have a very specific workload in mind, you probably don't need a specialty type of hard drive. Older SSDs can outperform newer SSDs. Remember that. Again, more expensive, not always better. Faster and more numerous hard drives will consume more power. If you're really a hard drive collector, if you want to call it that, like me, well, then yeah, it's a big concern. If you're just an average home user with a couple of computers, you probably don't really care much about power consumption, except, of course, for battery-operated devices, you might want to upgrade your laptop's hard drive to an SSD. You're not going to see a huge increase in runtime, but it will help. Finally, like I said, always back up. Backups are no joke. If you're not backing up your data, if you're relying on one hard drive, or even a pair of hard drives in a mirrored array to store all your data, 
there's plenty of things that can still happen to them that can cause you to lose everything. So always, always back up. Well, thanks for watching my very, very long video on hard drives. I hope it was helpful to you. And if you've come this far, I congratulate you and thank you for watching. Uh, if you want more information or more videos, some of which are more boring than this, some of which are less, check out s.co.tt. That's an actual web address. That's my blog. Or subscribe to this channel, like this video, uh, follow me on Twitter, and do some other internet-style stuff if you don't mind. It would help me out. Have a good night.